Hello, welcome to the Gemsbok. Today's topic is Portal, a game developed by Valve and originally released in 2007. Keep in mind that although fun and learning are the primary goals of all enrichment center activities, serious injuries may occur. I think it's fairly trivial to say that Portal is a significant and influential franchise, and that both Portal titles are excellent experiences well worth the time of any player. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the original Portal is such a cohesive and nearly flawless gaming experience that it should be remembered alongside such other towering encapsulations of solid game design and execution as Shadow of the Colossus, the original Half-Life, and, with an asterisk for its arguably unfinished sections, the first entry of the Dark Souls trilogy. But my praise for Portal 2, while still extensive and enthusiastic, is simply nowhere near as unmitigated or unending as my praise for Portal. The sequel represents minor but noticeable departures from the original in many elements related to both the tone of its narrative and the experience of its gameplay, and while some of these, like the title's art assets and music, are almost unquestionable improvements, many others are qualitative steps down in various ways. For the purposes of this video, I am restricting my comparison to the single-player campaigns of Portal and Portal 2. Due to the stellar co-op and test chamber creation features of Portal 2, as well as the additional length of Portal 2's campaign, I have spent longer playing the second game by a substantial margin. But the comparison I am setting out to make is between the campaigns of the two games. I will also be leaving out the challenge mode of the original Portal. These campaigns, after all, constitute the quintessential Portal experience, containing nearly all of the narrative details of the series, other than some tidbits in the co-op chambers and external comics. The nature of this video is such that it requires spoiling the plot of Portal and Portal 2, so you should only continue watching after this section if you either do not mind spoilers or have already played the games. As part of a previously mentioned required test protocol, we can no longer lie to you. When the testing is over, you will be missed. In the year following the release of Portal 2, reviews of the game were produced by both Matthew of Matthew Matosis and Ben Yahtzee Croshaw of Zero Punctuation, which share basically the same opinion, that Portal 2 is a great game which could have been better, and which doesn't quite live up to the legacy of its predecessor. I agree wholeheartedly with Matthew and Yahtzee on that sentiment, and in this video I intend to make a close study of exactly which departures from the original serve to weaken the otherwise stellar sequel. Along those lines, let's begin by considering the following words from Matthew Matosis, who sums up his experience of the original Portal thus. When Portal released, there was a surprise in store. Not only was the gameplay great, but it featured some of the best writing ever seen in a computer game. GLaDOS brought the empty halls of Aperture Science to life. Her dialogue was cold and mechanical, but draped in an endearing sense of black humor. The game could have been labeled great on its gameplay alone, but it was the successful implementation of GLaDOS and the atmosphere that brought to the game that elevated it into something more. The praise extended to the character of GLaDOS in that quote frames Matthew's ensuing critique of her petty tone and shallow, saccharine backstory in the sequel. But I think those changes to the character of GLaDOS are indicative of a more far-reaching tonal shift between the two titles. From Portal's serious tone, with a sense of humor, Any contact with the chamber floor will result in an unsatisfactory mark on your official testing record, followed by death, to Portal 2's overtly goofy and comedic tone. Not too bad, eh? Giant robot. Massive. It's not just me, right? I am bloody massive, aren't I? An aspect of the mood of the original Portal which is often overlooked or even forgotten is its creepiness. Portal is a bit of a creepy, and, for younger players, even mildly frightening game. The test chambers are sterile, lifeless, and hostile. Chell is completely alone with some fairly strange and threatening challenges. Cameras track her every movement. Soft-voiced, sentient turrets threaten Chell's physical safety and paint the wall with her blood when any shots land. Most of the music accompanying the game is understated, somber, and quiet. Even the main menu music that greets the player is a slow and foreboding piece. GLaDOS's references to Aperture's scientists and test subjects slowly take on an unnerving vibe as the player progresses through the game, never seeing any other humans. These concerns are crystallized into concrete and horrific threats, both when GLaDOS attempts to make good on her promise of disposing of Chell in a furnace, and when GLaDOS reveals her extensive and systematic use of neurotoxin to eradicate the scientists. If you manage to squeeze into a section outside of a chamber's white-walled facade, you find yourself in a dark and rusted corridor, etched with frantic warnings and cries for help from absent victims. Several such locations contain empty food containers, implying people were hiding out in the cramped corridors for some stretch of time. 
And finally, GLaDOS is formidable and intimidating in part because she speaks exclusively in a disaffected monotone. I don't think you're going where you think you're going. Much like GLaDOS's cultural predecessor, HAL 9000, in 2001 A Space Odyssey. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. Sure, it's not a horror game by any stretch of the imagination, and many of GLaDOS's most hostile lines come across as humorous. Killing you and giving you good advice aren't mutually exclusive. To say nothing of the companion cube sequence, and the fact that some of those etchings are the now infamous incantation that the cake is a lie. But there is a very real sense that Chell is portaling for her life, and that there is some actual tension to the ending escape sequence. It was this darkly comedic tone and ultimately serious atmosphere, I would contend, that facilitated the inclusion of the Easter eggs placing Aperture and Black Mesa in the same fictional universe. Every character in Portal 2 is lighter and more cartoonish than GLaDOS in Portal, from Wheatley to GLaDOS herself to the defective turret to, above all, Cave Johnson and his doting assistant Caroline. If you've cut yourself at all in the course of these tests, you might have noticed that your blood is pure gasoline. That's normal. We've been shooting you with an invisible laser that's supposed to turn blood into gasoline, so all that means is it's working. Gone is the authoritative, monolithic monotone of Portal's GLaDOS. Though, as a matter of minor convention, the desperately seeking turret voices are retained. Are you still there? Instead, GLaDOS moves from a curt, cruel tone of voice near the start of the game Here come the test results. You are a horrible person. to a soft, emotional tone of voice near the end of the game Oh my god! What has he done to this place? The latter sounding less like a disinterested artificial intelligence, and more like a human speaking through a minimal filter, much like Wheatley. If you've got any reservations, whatsoever, about this plan, now would be a tremendous time to voice them. On the subject of voice acting and the distractingly human performance of Wheatley, I don't think it's any coincidence that the main cast's voices are less processed and less intimidating in the second game. As for them being less processed, Stephen Merchant, who voices Wheatley, is a famous comedian. J.K. Simmons, who voices Cave Johnson, is a famous actor. Outside of her work with Valve, Ellen McLean, who voices GLaDOS and Caroline, is virtually unknown. She's an opera singer and a rarely heard voice actress. Perhaps, unlike with McLean in the original game, it would have felt budgetarily imprudent to bring on such big names for Portal 2, only to mask them with affected dialect choices or post-processing. For instance, here's a line as Ellen delivered it. Perfect. Please move quickly to the chamber lock, as the effects of prolonged exposure to the button are not part of this test. Once the recording was done, we processed all the dialogue to give it an extra computery edge. Perfect. Please move quickly to the chamber lock, as the effects of prolonged exposure to the button are not part of this test. Let's uh, go on one this time. Okay, ready? One. Get me, get out! Ow. And as for them being less intimidating, as it turns out, the main writers of both games don't seem to be aware of the fact that they changed the genre of the series between titles. Eric Wolpaw and Chet Falasek admit to believing that both games are principally comedies in, for instance, their GDC talk after the release of Portal 2, where Falasek says, You know, Portal 1's story kind of sneaks up on you. Players aren't sure if it's funny at first. Wheatley really quickly helps establish the tone right off. You know it's a comedy. He comes in, you're laughing. It's okay to laugh. The rest of the game, it's okay for you to laugh. It is, undoubtedly, okay to laugh. I laughed during my first playthroughs of both games. But in Portal, laughter is not the only or even the primary virtue of the experience. In Portal, GLaDOS is not exclusively a comedy act. Even when she is humorous, and it's fairly frequent, that comedy often derives from a dark and realistic premise related to her human experimentation, her misunderstanding of human values and motivations, or her disregard for human life. We are throwing a party in honor of your tremendous success. Place the device on the ground, then lie on your stomach with your arms at your sides. Assume the party escort submission position or you will miss the party. And many of her lines are not humorous, but instead perfunctory. A replacement aperture science weighted storage cube will be delivered shortly. Matter of fact. You appear to understand how a portal affects forward momentum, or to be more precise, how it does not. Or straightforwardly threatening. I'm not kidding now. Turn back, or I will kill you. As a result, at each of these slew of moments when GLaDOS actively tries to murder Chell in the latter half of the game, one feels a thrill at the immediacy and believability of the threat. In Portal 2, Cave Johnson is primarily a comedy act. 
If you're allergic to peanuts, you might want to tell somebody now because this next test may turn your blood into peanut water for a few minutes. Wheatley is primarily a comedy act. There are test subjects in Africa who don't even have monitors in their test chambers, all right? Why don't you think about that before you break any more of them, yeah? The instructive recordings in the first set of tests are as much comedy act as tutorial. This next test applies the principles of momentum to movement through portals. If the laws of physics no longer apply in the future, God help you. And yes, except for the very end of the game, GLaDOS is primarily a comedy act. In the sequel, even in her early segments where GLaDOS is doing nothing but threatening and insulting Chell, practically every line from her is a joke, and sadly many of them don't even land. Remember before when I was talking about smelly garbage standing around being useless? That was a metaphor. I was actually talking about you, and I'm sorry. You didn't react at the time, so I was worried it sailed right over your head, which would have made this apology seem insane. That's why I had to call you garbage a second time just now. When GLaDOS starts in on the writer's fourth or fifth attempt at humor that boils down to calling Chell fat, ugly, an orphan, or some combination of the three, you start to wish that Valve was even half as obsessed with getting every solitary line of dialogue right as they are with playtesting every rough edge out of their gameplay. When you die, I'm going to laminate your skeleton and pose you in the lobby. That way future generations can learn from you how not to have your unfortunate bone structure. Setting aside the dialogue writing and vocal performances though, this tonal shift is everywhere. The turrets return from the first game, as I said, but now they start firing on Chell slower, take longer to kill her when actively shooting her, and their bullets pass through her without drawing a single drop of blood. The game is almost universally less credibly threatening and less dark. Even levels that feel explicitly designed to be as moody and atmospheric as the latter half of the original, where the music and global lighting pull back, and the design of the sounds and sights of the facility push forward, the tone stays goofy because the companion characters never leave Chell alone and never shut their mouths. They say that the old caretaker of this place went absolutely crazy, chopped up his entire staff of robots. The sole exception to this seems to be the roughly five minutes between falling into Old Aperture and activating the first recording of Cave Johnson. Along the same lines, there are numerous set-piece sequences where Chell is in seemingly dangerous circumstances that are actually glorified cutscenes and thus transparently restricted from actually harming her or challenging the player in any way. The longest such sequence actually occupies a solid 10 minutes and is unfortunately the very beginning of the game, painstakingly establishing the foam-padded toothlessness of Portal 2's world. Perhaps there is no moment in the story, however, that captures the tonal departure between the games so concisely as comparing Chell's near execution in Portal to her near execution in Portal 2. In Portal, the scene is understated and full of dread, with GLaDOS narrating dispassionately while Chell is being lowered unceremoniously into a furnace to be discarded. In Portal 2, the scene is gaudy and ridiculous, with narration from power-mad goofball Wheatley and Caroline Potato GLaDOS, while Chell waits to be crushed by an unnecessarily massive encircling collection of spiky metal objects. While she portals away in both cases, only in the former did I feel any credible threat in the situation. The former is a moment in a memorable narrative. The latter is a moment in a theme park attraction. And regrettably, as will become crystal clear in the next section, this feeling of being on a six hour long theme park ride doesn't begin nor end with the narrative and aesthetics. Due to mandatory scheduled maintenance, the appropriate chamber for this testing sequence is currently unavailable. It has been replaced with a live fire course designed for military androids. Some of the new mechanics seem more silly as well, when taken all together. Other than the portal gun, all of the mechanics in the original portal were electronic devices, for example the switches, pressure plates, and Half-Life 2-esque energy balls, or realistic physical threats, for example turrets, pits of poisonous sludge, and toxic gas. On top of all of those elements, Portal 2 adds, among other things, tractor beams called excursion funnels, fling pads called aerial faith plates, goo that you slide around and bounce on called mobility gels, moon rock gel, laser beams, laser directing cubes, and hard light bridges. This is a collection of wacky sci-fi tools fit to be pulled out of hammer space. I suppose the best objection to this point would be that the portal gun itself is the wackiest sci-fi gadget of them all, yet is the central mechanic of both games. To that objection I would offer two responses. First, on their own, each of the new items is only slightly less serious than the mechanics of the original, but in juxtaposition with each other, the net cartoonishness rises. 
And second, their conceptual silliness is not actually my principal reason for bringing them up. But to tell you that principal reason, and thereby finish justifying having listed them here, we must take a slight detour to discuss difficulty. One complaint that I held firmly in my mind throughout even my very first playthrough of Portal 2 is that its tests were and are much, much too easy. Only the very last three of the over 50 puzzles in the game may be liable to give a player more than even a small moment's pause. The challenge of the original is nothing to write home about either, of course, but given the brevity of the game, it would be hard to argue that its difficulty curve is anything other than a smooth upward slope. And given the novelty of the Portal mechanic, it was at least initially challenging due to being unintuitive. Even granting that Portal 2 was likely designed with newcomers to the Portal mechanic in mind, however, it remains almost insultingly simple throughout. To see this, consider the fact that even after Portal 2 exhausts the full length of time that it takes to complete the entire original game twice over, the challenge of its puzzles has still yet to noticeably ramp up, and undergoes significant spans where the difficulty curve sits flat to accommodate tutorials. It is not to be discounted what a serious effect difficulty can have on the tone, meaning, and experience of a game. Consider a version of Dark Souls where all of the aesthetics and mechanics are identical, but the enemies are unable to harm the player, and the bosses die in one hit from any weapon at any level. Besides being a boring exercise, the game would feel tonally discordant. I can't believe that the world is as threatening as its cutscenes and NPC dialogue allege if the player character is never actively threatened by the world. Not every game, however, can or should be difficult. It would be similarly inappropriate for a Kirby title to be punishingly hard. Difficulty and thematic aims have to be balanced and crafted in tandem. Nonetheless, satisfaction as a player of any game comes from overcoming obstacles and challenges, and in some sense a game simply is a set of obstacles or challenges placed across an otherwise clear path of progress. In a puzzle game, this translates into the intellectual challenge of the levels. A difficult puzzle placed in the proper thematic context can make a player feel like an active participant in exploring that thematic context. Mist and Riven by Cyan, Space Chem and Infinifactory by Zaktronix, and Braid and the Witness by Jonathan Blow and Thecla are all legendarily excellent puzzle games in part because of their difficulty. As a player closes in on the end of Portal 2 and enters their fourth or fifth consecutive hour of puzzles that essentially solve themselves, they may start to wonder whether the developers were taking too seriously the oft-repeated notion that Chell's extended hibernation left her with brain damage you might have a very minor case of serious brain damage. Or, as Yahtzee puts it with his characteristic succinctness, Portal 2 is a sightseeing tour that begrudgingly has a puzzle game in it. Now, to finally return to my earlier point, I think the inclusion of the large number of new mechanics listed toward the start of this section is partially to blame for the excessively low difficulty of the game, which spends a large percentage of its time tutorializing such additions, then ends only a few puzzles after the last tutorial segment for the Excursion Funnels has concluded. In his review of Portal 2, Matthew Matosis rightly points out that the game's low difficulty is often also a result of the limited portalable surface area in most of the test chambers. After all, if there is a room full to the brim with possible portal locations, then it is harder to solve the puzzle just by random guessing or by tracing the developer's oft-transparent intentions. A few playtesters put a portal on the floor here and used the rising stair pit to skip the rest of the puzzle. We'll usually rework a level if playtesters discover a way to bypass chunks of the puzzle too easily. But in this and a few other cases where skipping ahead arguably takes more skill than solving the puzzle properly, we let the ninja solution stand. Conversely, if there are only a few spots that are eligible for portaling, one can exhaust all possible arrangements in a few attempts without expending much or any mental energy. To Portal 2's credit, though, one area of disagreement that I would have with both Yahtzee and Matthew Matosis is their extension of this limited portal surface criticism to their discussion of navigating the overworld in Old Aperture. Yes, it makes the navigation trivial, and mostly divorces it from the way that the out-of-bounds chapters of the original Portal carried on more subtly puzzling the player, but given the vastness of Old Aperture, to do otherwise would have been a nightmare. Imagining that same enormous expanse covered in portalable surfaces, but with the same or similarly limited slivers of progression toward the next section is all I need to do to see why its present implementation was needed. And I do think that the visual design and experience of those Old Aperture segments made the trade-off worthwhile or would have done so, had the test chambers punctuating the experience offered contrast to that style through satisfying difficulty and a multiplicity of strategic options. Fantastic. You remained resolute and resourceful in an atmosphere of extreme pessimism. 
So, why do I say the tone of Portal's campaign is better than that of its sequel? Because, instead of staying grounded in a threatening and realistic aperture, which happens to often be humorously cynical and clinical, Portal 2 opts to aim mainly for laughs, and secondarily for cliched empathy, at the expense of the story's immersion, stakes, and the presentation of GLaDOS. And why do I say the design of Portal's campaign is better than that of its sequel? Because instead of maintaining a tight, tough, and satisfying exploration of its mechanics throughout, the campaign of Portal 2 restricts player creativity, cranks down the challenge, and has many mechanics that are not fully integrated with each other after being laboriously tutorialized. Despite the specific points made throughout this video, and the pair of, uh, luminaries, sharing my opinion that I've quoted in the course of it, some people watching this video may still be tempted to think that I hold this view about these games simply out of some kind of blind bias against sequels, or indeed simply as a result of having played Portal before playing Portal 2. But if anything, just the opposite should be true. One of the ways in which I believe that games are unique when compared to other potentially narrative media like novels and films is that game sequels are very frequently superior to their predecessors. Gameplay is typically retained and iteratively improved between entries in a series, and a breakout success often brings additional budget for a sequel with more qualified art, writing, and music departments. One must, however, be careful when augmenting such elements for a sequel. Better art, writing, and music doesn't always mean more art, writing, and music. Portal 2 has more of practically everything, and some of it, like the music for instance, is certainly improved. But restraint can also be valuable, and even when implementing the sequel's excellent music, something of value was lost, namely the dedication to quietude that enhanced the experience of the first game. At any rate, now that I've spent this whole video extensively praising Portal at the expense of its sequel, I think it's appropriate to close by reiterating that Portal 2 is a wonderful game. It's fun, its aesthetic polish is top-notch, its co-op campaign is one of the best co-op experiences ever made, and its level editor, Steam Workshop integration, and mod community are an effectively endless supplement for those aspects of the difficulty which I found lacking in the main campaign. As an entire package, Portal 2 certainly offers a greater variety of worthwhile stuff to do than Portal, but considering only the artistic, gamely, and cohesive quality of their primary campaigns, Portal, despite its relative simplicity and age, remains the clear winner.